Hello there and welcome to Hello there and welcome to the Art of the Space Race with Steve Carroll. I'm uh, just getting the um, screen in order. It's just really good of you to all uh, join me. I'm very pleased that you're um, supporting this. And I do hope you're safe after Storm Eunice, which was quite an unpleasant uh, situation, but um, I, I hope you're all safe now. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, the art of the space race because it's actually a, a subject in art which is overlooked. Um, I can, before I actually even uh, started preparing this talk, I could only think of about five artists that I knew of who had actually explored anything to do with outer space in their art at all. Let me just say that with this talk, I'm not going to be looking at things like um, fan art, um, popular culture, Star Wars, Star Trek, Doctor Who, even though I love all of those things. I am really um, wanting to look at arts, which the type of art you get in galleries, which um, you might want to talk about as being high art. And I'm sorry if that seems very non postmodern and a little bit snobby, but I am really interested in the um, art that has made an impact in the art world and is making an impact on, on serious minded artists. Now, I want to start off with this image here. This is the famous image that Neil Armstrong took of Buzz Aldrin on the moon when they landed in the summer of 1969. Now, I was a child, I was nine years old when this happened, and I thought it was the most remarkable, wonderful thing that it could possibly ever happen. It was like science fiction come real. And I can remember, I even remember where I was when I had this thought as a nine-year-old boy. I remembered those diagrams in school of fish growing legs millions of years ago and crawling up onto the land, becoming amphibians and then becoming land creatures and eventually dominating the dry land. And I thought that I was living at a moment like that in the evolution of mankind. I thought I was living at a time when we'd actually stepped out of this, this pond, which is the earth, onto another world. And although it wasn't that exciting, we didn't see any aliens, we didn't see any life or anything like that. It was just the moon. It was still a huge step. And this was the beginning of the conquest of space. And eventually we would be living in a universe a bit like the one in Star Trek, where we would be going to other planets, we would be meeting aliens, we would be having all sorts of adventures out in space. But sadly, that didn't happen. Budget cuts in the 1970s meant there were no more uh, journeys to the moon. And afterwards, when you look at it, um, it is, was a little bit of a, a, a propaganda posing. It was basically done, as Neil Armstrong said, to beat the Russians. And that puts a little bit of a you know, bad light on it, I suppose. But I'm still fascinated that this fantastic triumph of human ingenuity never had any effect on art. All the great steps in mankind's development, whether you think about things like the, the Reformation, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolutions, they all had an impact upon how we saw the world and that was reflected in art. The space race didn't do that. And I'm asking the question, why? Let me now turn to this next slide. Uh, this is actually a photograph, and it's a very old photograph, I know. It's of Albert, Albert Einstein and Edwin Hubble. It's taken in 1931 in Hubble's observatory. And what Hubble is doing is he wants to demonstrate to Albert Einstein that the stars in our sky have what's known as a red shift. Now, what does that mean? Well, Albert Einstein uh, he saw the universe as being a place where all the heavenly bodies attracted each other. The way it's been explained to me is if you imagine a trampoline and you put a bowling ball in the middle of the trampoline, it will make a great big dent. If you then throw a tennis ball onto the, onto the trampoline, it will gravitate towards where the bowling ball is making a great big dent because it's making an impact on, it, it has a, a gravitational force. But People, uh, there were certain people who thought that his theory was wrong. One of them was a Belgian priest called La Maestra. And they worked out the math. So they thought there's something going wrong here, that this isn't actually how what we see. 
And they thought that if basically this was happening, then all the heavenly bodies would be pulling together. They'd be coming towards each other. But when we look out into space, we actually see that they have a red shift, which means they're going away from each other. Now, this is the, when we talk about the red shift, we're talking about something called the Doppler effect. <clears throat> you may know that light and sound travel at a constant speed. And if you're standing by a road and a car comes towards you, it's got a high pitched sound. It goes, Neow! and then when it passes you, it goes, Neow! because as the sound is coming towards you, the, the sound is being compressed. So it goes into a higher pitch. As it goes away from you, it's being extended. The wavelengths are extended. It makes a lower pitch. And it's the same with light. If something was coming towards you, a, a heavenly star a, 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 um, was coming towards you, it would have a blue shift, the higher frequency of light. But they don't have that. They have a red shift. That means that everything is actually going away from each other. And there must have been some beginning to the universe. Now, the uh, British astronomer Fred Hoyle ridiculed this idea and he referred to it as the Big Bang, but I'm afraid it's stuck because all the evidence shows that the universe did have a beginning. Now, this was all going on in the 1930s. Did it have any effect on art? Did it change the way artists saw the world around them? No, it didn't. And there's a reason for that. And I think it's because of this. This is a photograph of Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud, back in back, as far back as 1899, he'd written a book called The Interpretation of Dreams, and he believed that there was something called the subconscious. There was something in our, in our minds which basically uh, controlled a lot of what we do, a lot of our thinking and our reactions to life. And it's all to do with trauma back when we were children, and it has this marked effect upon us, and we're not aware of it, but the art, the um, science of psychoanalysis can actually find these traumas, find why we are behaving in a certain way. And this is what fascinated artists. They weren't looking at outer space, they were looking at inner space inside the mind, because they thought there was something far more uh, inspiring, far more uh, visual and interesting looking inside the mind than looking out into the cold darkness of space. And when obviously the um, art movement that came out of uh, Sigmund Freud's theories was surrealism, which um, the founder Andre Breton described as being pure psychic automatism. What that means is thinking without any influence from society, from people around us, from belief systems. It's just thought that just goes freely. And of course, we uh, experience this when we dream. And so that's what the surrealists were. To some extent, they were the painters of dreams looking inside the mind. If you try to find references to outer space in early modern art, early 20th century art, you uh, don't come up with very much. This is a sculpture called A Universe, not the universe, A Universe, by Alexander Calder, and it was created in 1934. It's not without interest, but uh, it's not, I don't think, a great uh, work of art. It tends to remind me of those things you find in doctor's surgeries to keep kids occupied, those things with beads on, on wires. Um, you know, it, 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 it's interested, but it's, it, it's not as, doesn't have as much presence, as much power as uh, the sculptures of, of Picasso, of uh, Gonzales, people like that. We can look at another artist here. This is Juan Miro, who was um, a Spanish surrealist. This is called Constellations. And it's interesting because Picasso around about this time was um, doing something very, very similar to this, another Spaniard. But is Constellations anything to do with astronomy? No, it's to do with astrology. The idea of Constellations goes right back to ancient Babylon. They were the people who first look up into the stars and you noticed patterns in the stars and joined the dots and thought they were people and they made stories about them. This isn't really about the outer space. It's still all about inner space, however wonderful it is.
these um, wonderful textures he has behind the these floating symbols. And this is the type of thing you, you look into it and you try to find things. You can sometimes you can see, I can see a face. Um, I know you're not supposed to say, say that, but basically he's doing exactly what the ancient Babylonians did. He's creating these random patterns and then he's seeing things in it. This isn't really science. This isn't really the art of space. This is very much uh, looking into the human mind. Now, the space race really got started with um, the launch of this satellite. This is Sputnik 1 from launched in 1957, and it was a Russian Soviet uh, satellite that uh, was sent up into space. And all it had on it was a tiny little radio transmitter that just went beep, beep, beep. Beep. But it scared the life out of the Americans because they thought, well, these satellites eventually will be able to look down on us. They may even be able to drop bombs on us. So this is really when the space race started. Um, this type of art, just to say something about this, this is, this is all very clever. Um, this is an artist's impression, and we're going to be looking at a few of these. Um, again, I don't see it as, as, as great art. Um, it, they're, they're important because they were the only way um, that people could get across uh, the vision of the um, space agencies. Um, you know, if you, 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 in those days, you didn't have CGI, you couldn't do uh, an, an, a wonderful animation. All you had were paintings. And this is um, one of those. And it, it's a very fine, um, you know, very fine example of that. And then, of course, in 1961, the Soviets did it again with Yuri Gagarin, a handsome poster boy for the Soviet Union, who was the first man to actually go up into space. And as you can imagine, again, this rather, um, rather, rather concerned the Americans who were being kept behind in the Cold War period. Um, of course, the other, the other sad thing was, was that this uh, Yuri Gagarin um, didn't live long after this. Of course, you may know that he was um, he died in a, a plane accident. And there's lots of controversy and conspiracy theories around that, uh, why he actually um, died. But we'll, we'll leave that aside. The fact is, we're now talking about 1961 and there's a real spaceman, a real man in outer space. So the space race is really hotting up. And of course, the Russians um, liked to say a lot about this. And this is a wonderful um, example of the poster art they would create. So here you have a sort of science fiction type rocket ship going up into space. And there on the moon, it's got the Soviet badge. The Soviets are claiming it. And there you have down below a woman in red, communist red, looking up. This is so aspirational. This is almost like religious art, but now in a scientific age. And what it says at the bottom is in the name of peace. So we often think about it as being, uh, you know, the, the space race driven by uh, military concerns. But here we have the Soviets saying no, it's in the name of peace and it's all done in the name of the workers of the world. Now, when we come to actual fine art, I've said before that it's very hard to find many artists who were even interested in outer space. And as the space race took off, you don't find many American artists who seem to be that interested in what was going on. But the Soviets, they were there way ahead and way before even the Bolshevik revolution happened. Here you have a Russian artist called Lyubov Popova, and he has done this painting called Air Man Space. And look at the date, 1913 to 14. It's just before the beginning of the First World War, before the um, communist rebellion had actually even happened. And here we have a painting and the style of this painting, we call this cubism. It's um, reminiscent of what uh, Picasso was doing back in the uh, first decade of the 20th century. Now what cubism is, it sounds like it's got something to do with cubes. That was really just a nickname that was attached to the movement and stuck. It's really looking a different way of looking at perspective. 
So instead of going back to the Renaissance, when uh, if there was one single point of perspective, there was a vanishing line and everything had to point towards the vanishing line. I'm sure you did that type of exercise at school. What we have here is a painting where the subject, at this time a man was sitting down, we are told, um, is actually seen from lots of different perspectives, as if the artist is taking snapshots all around the subject, and then he's putting those, those snapshots together, collaging them together into lots of different views. So you get this wonderful, jagged, geometric look. And this, of course, was the most, I, I believe, was the most revolutionary uh, style of the 20th century. This is where, where modern art really leaves the old art um, you know, from the Renaissance until the 19th century, uh, leaves all that behind, and it really becomes something new. But what an interesting title, Air, Man, Space. It's almost as if this is predicting the cosmonaut sitting in his Soyuz capsule with all his instruments around him. A very predictive painting. This is another one. This is um, uh, actually after the Bolshevik Revolution, and this is by Konstantin Yuan, and it's called simply New Planet. Now, the Soviets um, were very, very proud of, this, uh, of, the, of the, the, the Bolshevik Revolution. They thought this was something that mankind had never achieved before. Uh, before, it had always been a, a case of masters and servants, kings and subjects, the aristocracy, the lower classes, the workers, and this was the first time all of that had been toppled up, side down, and now it was the basic workers of the world, the ordinary people who were in charge of their own destiny. And to Constantine Yuan, it seemed as if they were living on a completely new planet. This was the new world. It wasn't about discovering America. It wasn't about going to another planet. It was about making this world into a completely different world, a new planet. And here we have this marvelous um, painting where it seems like the people below seem to be still to be fighting and they still seem to be in a struggle. Or are they overwhelmed by the wonder of what they see in the heavens? Suddenly this uh, these planets suddenly appear and it's like you're in a completely new and different cosmos with these rays of light coming up from the earth. The earth itself is now a new planet. And you'll notice that the planet that uh, seems to be nearest to us, that one um, over on the left, is a red planet. And of course, that had a lot of political symbolism to the Soviets, the red planet. Were we now living on the red planet? Could we make this the red planet? And so you do find in <clears throat> a lot of uh, Soviet um, creativity, this emphasis on Mars, the red planet. And this is a... Um, uh, a, a still from a film that was made. First of all, it was a play, then it was turned into a film, and it's by Yakov Protozanov, and it's um, called Elita, Queen of Mars. This was made in 1924. Now, this film is basically all about a man called Loss, who's in Moscow, and suddenly Moscow starts receiving these strange radio signals, and he wonders what they are, and he realizes they're actually coming from Mars. So he climbs into a rocket ship that he was actually building in his spare time. Now, let's just stop there. 1924, the idea that they were already thinking about building rockets. And there were also scientific experiments with rockets, uh, looking at different fuels, different, you know, different trajectories, all this type of thing. Um, and so they were, they were already considering this. But Loss gets into his rocket and he goes off to Mars. And there he falls in love with Alita. And on Mars, there's a terrible um, oppressive regime, a terrible, you know, capitalist, capitalist regime. And what um, happens is Loss and his uh, newfound um, love, Alita, um, end up being put in prison. But they escape from prison and they start a rebellion and they get the workers to rise up against their overlords and to actually crush the system. But the only problem is Alita wants to become queen. She wants, basically, she's going backwards. And, uh, but Loss you know, says, disagrees and he actually ends up killing Alita. And then all of a sudden he wakes up to find it was all a terrible dream and that the radio signal hitting Moscow wasn't from Mars at all. It was an American adver advert for car tires. But when we look at this, if you think about uh, what, what the art that we've been looking at, the art of cubism with all these strong angles, you can see this 
in, in this, this still. Look at the strong angles in the background. Look at the costumes. Look at that strange perspex beard the man is wearing. And look at that strange skirt that she's wearing. It's like a piece of kinetic sculpture. So as she walks along, those hinged uh, <laughs> structures um, move with her. I think this is quite remarkable. And there are some wonderful stills, if you want to look this up, wonderful models that they made of um, imagining a city on Mars. And it's like a piece of cubist sculpture. This really is incredible creativity, very interesting ideas coming. And it's, this is all coming from the Soviet Union. Sorry, there's just something happening with my... There we go. Now, let's get back to what the Americans were doing. Well, here's another artist's impression. And this is a impression of the um, one of the ranger probes. Now, these um, were, you, you can't really call them satellites because they didn't go round the moon. They just were, were basically sent to the moon. And they were sent with cameras on board and their mission was to take photographs of the moon surface so that they could find landing sites for a possible landing on the moon. And you might say, well, you know, I don't see any legs. How on earth did this land? Well, they didn't land at all. They crashed. They would just send these probes to the moon and just crash them. But on their way, they would take lots of lots of photographs. And you can just about, you can see the um just not not too far down from the the nose section. You can see those um, cylinders pointing down. Those are the cameras. And when what they sent back were images like this. Now this is a digital image of the moon's surface with these famous grids. You see the little squares, the little hairlines there, which were used to, uh, you know, they could, they could then measure, um, you know, the, the areas that they were looking at. But these were really the first digital photographs. They worked on a basis that um, yeah, the, the, the cameras would send back a series of numbers. And if something was completely white, it would send back a, a zero. And if something was completely black, it would send, send a nine. And anything in between, it would send that. So it's a, a, if it was a pale gray, it would be maybe a two or a three. If it was a dark gray, it would be a seven or an eight. And um, so these are the first digital um, cameras, not a very great range, but um, you know, this, is, this was the start anyway. Interestingly enough, um, not long after these were taken, this technology was used in art galleries. Our own National Gallery had cameras like this in order to photograph and archive all the paintings, because one of the concerns they had was that our paintings and our collections were actually losing their losing their colour. They were fading because back in the day, um, people like Sir Joshua Reynolds in particular uh, weren't very good at mixing paint and the colour didn't um, wasn't very light fast. And so they were concerned that these paintings would actually just fade away. So the cons conservation team needed to know where they had to work. So these um, photographs were taken with this kind of NASA technology. But they, these photographs also inspired a particular British artist. And his name was John Tonnard. And he sent this, he, he did this painting called The Messenger in 1969. And um, I can't help thinking that what he's referring to here is the importance of the um, on-ground satellites to these uh, space missions. There was one particular um, very important uh, satellite dish like that, like this in Australia, which malfunctioned. And it was absolutely critical for receiving television pictures uh, to show to everybody. And there was a big, um, you know, the, the, it, it was a big scramble to get this particular dish working. It was, um, there's a famous film called The Dish with Sam Neill, if you want to look that up, it's quite a, an enjoyable film. But the thing that um, John Tunnard uh, was interested in was those pictures of the moon. Can you see how there's that texture, especially in the sky, as you go over to the right hand side? He created this by mixing very thick gesso, which is um, a substance for priming canvases. And he would really layer this on and he would use that texture. So he's taking those textures from the moon surface and he's putting them here into his paintings. And on top of that, it's also got, you know, quite a, a slightly cubist feel, although, you know, it's a representational painting of um, 
of, of a radar antenna. It's also got an incredible abstract feeling to it. There's a lot of um, breaking of the uh, composition up, this wonderful blue frame that comes up through the middle of the right hand side and then this very strong red line is that referring to the fact that the russians got there first i don't know but it's uh <laughs> there's a console over the other side you can just about make out like a little black and white television screen and then it's got all these little lines on and of course these are that's a reference to um uh, Houston to mission control the type of screens they had where they were actually monitoring the um uh, the you know the, the progress of the Apollo 11 astronauts. So here we have a British painting of um, in the the year that mankind landed on the moon. Uh, really, also utilizing the aesthetic that was coming from these scientific photographs uh, being sent back to Earth. Now. Here we have, um, we're just going back in time a little bit. This is John Glenn, and this is the capsule, uh, the Mercury capsule, Friendship 7. And here we had uh, now that the Americans had their own poster boys, these very uh, handsome astronauts going up into space. And John Glenn was the first um, person to, the first American to go into space and do several orbits of the um, of the of the Earth. Um, I think he did five orbits of the Earth. And um, so this photograph in itself is, is I, th I think, quite a historic photograph, quite an interesting photograph. But I want to now show you something that, was, that came out of this. And this is a painting that I discovered in Pallant House in Chichester, not far from where I live. And this is by a, um, a South African artist called Denise Bowen, and it's simply called Colonel Glenn. And it's um, painted in the same year that he did his famous um, orbit of the uh, of our planet. Now, when I first saw this, uh, first thing I thought of was he's, he's describing the incredible power of the spacecraft taking off. And can you see there's this great big black area and then coming out of it, there's, there's almost like volcanic, this red and white bursting up out of it. And he's done a little bit of a Jackson Pollock. He's splashed some of the paint on really to, because it's the only way you can really get across the immense power and energy of um, a, a spacecraft launch. But it could be that he's also thinking about John Glenn coming back into the atmosphere and back to Earth. And that's because uh, there was a malfunction when um, uh, John Glenn was uh, orbiting the planet. Uh, it was noticed that his heat shield had slipped. And that meant that when he came back through the atmosphere, he wouldn't be fully protected and his capture would burn up. And so what they did is they decided to keep a part of the, um, the maneuvering, the, the rocket pack, which is like strapped to the back of the capsule and it's used to um, maneuver the uh, capsule round. They decided to keep that on so that it would hold the heat shield in place. Well, it worked because he got back safely and he went on in his later years to even fly as a passenger on the space shuttle. But I do, um, you know, I have seen reports that back in 1962, obviously I'm too young to um, remember that, but I do remember the, the, the world held its, its, its breath as John Glenn came back into the atmosphere. And I think this is a very, very powerful painting by a very lesser known artist, but it's one that should be known about. Um, if we go on into the, the 60s, the swinging 60s, and um, this is Andy Warhol in his art studio, which he referred to as the factory, and he did his wonderful screen prints and he churned them out and he was selling them. It was a very commercial venture and he had studio hands. And uh, one of the things that he said is, I want to become a machine. Uh, and the, uh, the, he's got this cow wallpaper up there. And he said, well, because I find boring things interesting. But uh, what um, I, I find interesting about this photograph, you'll notice the silver foil all across the back. Now, this isn't um, baker foil. This isn't the stuff you'd wrap your um, chickens up and put them in the oven. This is actually a, like an industrial foil that's used in factories. And when asked why he liked his... Um, uh, his, his studio wrapped in silver foil. He said, oh, it's so beautiful. He said, it's the color of astronauts' spacesuits, the color of astronauts' spacesuits. And I thought that was very, very interesting that, you know, that aesthetic, something that was very functional, um, was beginning to be seen as beautiful and was coming into the art world. Um, this um, is a painting by a British pop artist by the name of Derek Boschier. 
and it's called I Wonder What My Heroes Think of the Space Race. Now, um, Boschier was one of those artists, a bit like Peter Blake. Um, he was basically a British pop artist. Pop art is a very interesting phenomena. We always think of people like Andy Warhol, but it basically started all on its own in three different places. It started in uh, London, England, it started in New York, and it also started in Paris. In Paris, it was called Nouveau Art. And uh, it basically what it was, was the celebration of low culture. So instead of painting having to be about um, things in the Bible or things in the classics or history painting or famous, famous leaders and all that type of thing, uh, painting could be about a tin of soup or it could be about um, but made up of posters uh, that have been ripped from walls as it was in Paris. And here, uh, Derek Boschier was somebody who was fascinated by America. Now you've got to think about these artists grew up um, in post-war austerity when rationing was still going on. And if they saw American magazines or American films, wow, didn't it look more exciting over in America? Uh, America was just the land of the free, the land, it was a land of colour, it wasn't dreary like it was in Britain. And so here we have Derek Boschier, and there is, is his heroes, um, well you can see Buddy Holly, um, it's kind of like uh, in the top right corner, and there's Abraham Lincoln, and I think there's Horatio Nelson near the top, yes, and it's interesting because if you look, um, there's, uh, there's a, an unfinished painting of Nelson, which is just over his statue on Nelson's column, but Nelson's column has become a rocket with US on it. And there you have a, an astronaut right in the middle, and there you've got, it's also hanging over a planet which seems to be dripping with blood. And I think what this is looking at is, you know, the space race is a wonderful thing, but there's also some terrible things happening down on our planet. What would my heroes think of the space race? Would Abraham Lincoln have really thought uh, that it was worthwhile when there's so many problems on Earth? What would Buddy Holly have thought about it? What would Nelson have thought about it? It's a very interesting painting and it brings in this, um, this other side of the space race is, was it worth it? What did it actually achieve? You know, when there are um, wars and famine and terrible ecological problems already happening at this point on the planet, why are we going off to the moon? Now, the other um, area, of course, which um, the space race inspired was, of course, film. And I said I wasn't going to be looking at things like Star Wars, but I am going to be looking at this uh, film, which is Stanley Kubrick's 2001 a Space Odyssey from 1968. Why? Because I don't think it was just a film. It wasn't just a science fiction film. It was asking big, big questions about man's place in the universe. Uh, it was um, one of the inspirations for George Lucas to make Star Wars. Um, George Lucas actually said he still thought 2001 was a better film. And a lot of people th uh, think that it is actually one of the greatest movies ever made. When it first came out, it wasn't, um, it was panned. A lot of people didn't understand it. They thought it was slow. Um, you know, it, was, it was confusing, but a younger generation came along and they absolutely loved it. One of that younger generation who saw this, of course, was David Bowie, who then went on to write Space Oddity, which uh, was his first great hit. Um, so here we have uh, an astronaut going down a, uh, a corridor in a spacecraft in his wonderful red, groovy 1960s red and orange spacesuit. But the bit that most people remember is the sequence at the end, which was actually, um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a lot of people are, are confused by it. Some people thought it was uh, pretentious. Other people who were in the cinema at the time smoking illegal substances thought it was absolutely brilliant. It was like a psychedelic acid trip going it going into another dimension. A lot of people didn't know what it was uh, what, what it was about, um, but they just loved it. And it's using a technique called slit scan photography. It's the same technique that was used if anybody remembers the old. Doctor Who back in the 60s that was used for the um, opening credits to Doctor Who. It's a, it, it sounds like a very simple um, but it, uh, uh, process, but it's actually a bit complicated. I won't go into how it worked, but uh, Kubrick had to actually build a machine to actually make this work. He wanted to get this just right. 
but it's um it, it, it is an incredibly creative wonderful um part of that film where basically the astronaut david bowman is taken in his little pod spacecraft into like another dimension into another world and uh i have to say when i first saw the film you do feel a bit lost you do feel where on earth am i where where am i in the film you know the old film seems to have been left behind and i'm just in this other world now it's very very disconcerting uh, a wonderful piece of cinema but um later on there was another um oh, um no yeah, there was another um film uh, that was made by a russian and this was um solaris which uh, was made by Andrei Tarkovsky, a wonderful, wonderful filmmaker. Um, it came out in 1972, so four years after uh, 2001. And I do remember when I was a, a kid, when I, um, when I was 12, when this came out. And I do remember in the, in the newspapers, it was advertised as the Russian answer to 2001, almost like the space race. The Americans have made this marvelous film. The Russians are gonna make a marvelous film too. Well, that's not quite right. Tarkovsky was not a fan of the Soviet regime and they weren't a fan of him. Um, late, later on in the 1980s, he had to actually make his films outside uh, the Soviet Union because they didn't like the spiritual aspect that he was bringing to his, um, to his films. So here you have um, uh, a, again, what is this? This is an astronaut walking down the corridor of a spaceship, but he's not wearing a groovy orange and red spacesuit. He's got, got his pants, he's got his, in his pants and his shirt is tucked into his pants and he's walking barefoot through this littered, really awful, um, <laughs> really untidy space station called and the space station in this story is orbiting a planet called Solaris. Now this is based on a book written by Stanis Stanislav Lem and the story is about a planet called Solaris and when you um, go to it, go anywhere near it, the planet has this a way of creating hallucinations but the problem is the hallucinations become solidified, they become real and whatever is your deepest concern or your, your deepest hang up in life it makes that it makes a hallucination out of that and the, the the actual people you're thinking about become real and in the story the um the 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 the, the, the scientist here who's walking down the corridor um his wife had actually um commit suicide and what happens is that his dead wife keeps uh, comes back and reappears and they fall in love again and it's all wonderful. But the problem is the hallucination is so real that the psychology of the wife becomes real and she keeps committing suicide over and over again. And it's a very harrowing and very strange film. Um, a lot of people find Tarkovsky's films a bit slow and it could even be that his films inspired uh, Stanley Kubrick's um, really drawn out slow approach to 2001. But I, I think they, they work beautifully. They're like meditations and and they, um, one of the phrases that people use to describe his filmmaking is that he sculpts time. He really uses time in his films as, as a, a, you know, an important aspect of the film. But the other thing that's interesting about this is that um, American science fiction and uh, Russian science fiction are very different. When you have American science fiction, you might think of a program like Star Trek. And basically Star Trek is all about people getting into a spaceship, going across the universe, discovering new things, coming across you know, survival crises, meeting new races, negotiating with them, fighting them off, and eventually their own way uh, it prevails. And it's very much like the story of America, the story of people coming to this vast continent of America, going across, meeting the indigenous people, getting into relationship situations with them, fighting them off, beating them, and eventually colonizing the entire continent. But Russian history isn't like that. Russian history is quite different. What you get with Russian science fiction is instead of conquering planets, the, 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 the writers go inside the mind and they're far more psychological. And for that matter, actually, I find them far more interesting. If we're going to talk about um, fi you know, fine art, I actually think photography 
is a wonderful art. And I think the photographs that were taken on the Apollo missions are among some of the most important photographs ever taken. And here we have a very, very beautiful picture of the command module. Now this was taken from the lunar module um, that had just been to, um, you know, landed on the surface of the moon. It's coming back up and it's docking now with the command module. This is something that is a critical part of the mission that has to be done um, you know perfectly you can't there's no room for error with this and here is this beautiful silver spacecraft a real spaceship something out of fantasy is now real there with all its probes and its antennae and its beautiful silver shell which is reflecting the moon and you look at the moon and it's just this vast wilderness nothing on it just craters filled with craters and there is this man the man um, Collins who's inside that all on his own and everything is down to him to make this mission work. It's a, uh, a beautiful photograph, not just of, you know, something remarkable and out of this world, but it's also a beautiful photograph of human ingenuity and heroism. This, of course, is one of the most famous pictures. It's the picture of the astronaut's um, footprint on the moon. And, it, it, you know, just a simple thing like that, a footprint. And yet, what does it say? It says so much about you know, the achievement, actually get there. We've actually made our mark, our imprint on the moon. And of course, the thing about this footprint is that it will never, never ever blow away. It will always stay there. It will always, um, there's no wind on the moon, so nothing's gonna blow it away. You can go back in a thousand years time and Neil Armstrong's footprint will still be there. It, 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 you know, it basically, you know, isn't this art, isn't this like making your mark, making an impression that, you know, this is as well as being um, a wonderful photograph and a wonderful achievement. It's always like a piece of art, like the very first cave paintings when human beings made their, um, their longings and their, their desire for survival. Uh, you know, apparent by um, put, putting, you know, their food stuff, what they hunted. Um, onto the cave, the, the, the walls of caves. Now we have human beings just putting their footprint bang down onto the surface of another world. And it's like saying, we're here, we've made it all the way from the caves to the moon. I think this is a remarkable, remarkable photograph, as is um, this one. This is a photograph called Earthrise. And um, we've seen photographs of moon rises, um, the moon coming up over the horizon. We've seen photographs of the sunrise and the sunset, but never before had we ever seen earth rise, the actual earth coming up, appearing over the, the, the dead landscape of the moon. And this had a very strong impact upon a lot of people because not only is it a wonderful, you know, beautiful photograph, but it, 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 it's, so, it's very meaningful because you know, you've got to think that like the Vietnam War was raging down there. You've got to think that all the things that people got upset about, the, the Cold War, the arms race, the, uh, what was happening in Africa, Biafra, all these things were going on down there, but that's all we've got we don't have anything else. If you come outside of Earth, you've just got this dead moon. Everything we love, everything that's precious to us is actually down there on that beautiful pearly planet with those wonderful oceans and clouds. And it made people realize that really we've got to protect that planet. It's got this thin atmosphere over it. We don't have another one. There's no planet B. And so it also inspired a lot of ecological concerns. So, you know, I think this is, a, a, again, a very, very momentous, wonderful photograph. And then this last one, this is by um, a photograph by Charles Duke. Um, and this was, uh, this was taken in 1972 in one of the subsequent um, Apollo uh, pro programs, Apollo 16. And what he did was he took a photograph of him and his family and he put it in a plastic bag and he just left it on the moon so he can tell his kids <laughs> uh, there's a photograph of you on the moon so when those those boys growing up they're probably you know the ceos of companies now they can they always know there's a photograph of them with their mum and dad on the moon i think this is quite a remarkable thing the perfect american family on the moon of course one of the problems is unlike the footprint the light um the sunlight hitting the moon is pretty powerful um if you look at the um the actual rock of the moon it's actually basalt which is actually a very on this on earth it's a very black dark 
uh, rock, but it's been absolutely bleached by the constant sunlight. There's no clouds. And uh, so, um, you know, it, I think this photograph will eventually fade, but it's still a wonderful thing. I'd lo love the, the, for somebody to maybe go there uh, when they go back to the moon and actually find this. It's, a, it's a, like a piece of conceptual art, this for me. I think it's quite wonderful, but it also raises questions about ownership and about, um, you know, about the values of the people who went up there, people with very, very conservative values, and questions about does that really represent the whole of the planet, the way in which society runs down below. Now, here is, um, uh, at last, we have a, a picture by an American artist of the Apollo mission. It's called Moonwalk by Andy Warhol. But if you look at it, 1986, Andy, why did it take you so long to do something about the moon landings? Um, because this is now uh, more than a decade old, uh, the, this image of Armstrong on, on the moon um, and with the American flag. Uh, and to me, it's if there's something a little bit, I don't know, a little bit dull about it, uh, simply the fact it took so long. And also, it's it, one wonders whether um, Warhol is really celebrating the achievement of landing on the moon. I think it looks far more like the logo for MTV, which would have been starting around about this time would have been um, in full throttle actually uh, the music um, TV station that was available to people so you could see just non-stop music videos um, they had a logo which was very much like this and uh, I think that's what it's, it's, it's um, referring to I mean one of the things remember Warhol said was that um, I find boring things interesting and one of the things the criticisms was the coverage of the moon landings had become very old hat and people were thinking to themselves, well, um, you know, we, we, we've seen that. How can you make this more interesting? And so you had people like taking little lunar rovers where you saw Alan Shepard took some golf balls up in Apollo 12 and um, uh, he played golf on the moon. But it, it was beginning to get a little bit passe. And I actually think that's what Warhol is saying, is that it's become like a product that you sell, like a tin of soup or something like that. It just happens over and over again. Yes, the Americans stick a flag in the, on the moon, but it's actually becoming a little bit dull. And one of the, um, uh, one of the things about um, the American moon landings is, of course, that, you know, there is this question, was it really worth it? I mean, they brought back moon rocks, but did you know that the Russians actually sent a probe called Lunacod, which was like a kind of a robot rover, and they went round and they managed to bring moon rock back to Earth without endangering the lives of astronauts. And, you know, there, there is this big thing, you know, it, is it worth it? Is it worth all the billions and billions of dollars that was spent to do this? And one of my favourite um, reactions to this is a poem by the African-American poet Gil Scott Heron who at the time of the moon landings, he wrote a poem which was simply called Whitey on the Moon. And I'd like to recite that for you. A rat, Whitey on the Moon, a rat done bit my sister Nell with Whitey on the Moon. Her face and arms began to swell and Whitey's on the Moon. I can't pay my doctor bill, but Whitey's on the Moon. 10 years from now, I'll be paying still with Whitey on the Moon. The man just upped my rent last night because white is on the moon. No hot water, no toilets, no lights, but white is on the moon. I wonder where he, why he's upping me because white is on the moon. I was already paying 50 a week with white on the moon. Taxes taking my whole damn check. Junk is making me a nervous wreck. The price of food is going up. And if that, that shit wasn't enough, a rat down bit my sister now with white on the moon. Her face and arm began to swell, but white is on the moon. Was all that money I made last year for Whitey on the Moon? How come there ain't no money here? Hmm, Whitey's on the Moon. You know, I just about had my fill of Whitey on the Moon. I'll send these doctor's bills to Whitey on the Moon. Special airmail, Whitey on the Moon. That's quite powerful. And during the um, launch of the Apollo uh, 11 mission, um, busloads of African American people. Um, the, these were these often these uh, protests were organised by churches, uh, Baptist churches down in the deep south. And these coach loads would come to the moon landings to protest, saying, "You're sending a, a white guy up to the moon, and we're living in substandard, um, you know, living conditions." And I think that's a very, very powerful statement and a very, very powerful question about this. And I have to say, if I'm, if I may say that. Um, 
very often when I'm, I meet Americans, I have American friends. If I talk about the space missions, I often find American people don't talk about them um, very much because I think they're aware that there is this controversy. And interesting enough, when I have met Russian people and I've spoken about the Russian space missions, they've been very proud of it and very happy to talk about it because very much it was um, the workers, the ordinary guys, the ordinary factory workers who built those machines. And they see them as a triumph for the people. Here's another um, thing that uh, is causing controversy. Now, this is a, um, uh, a plaque from a probe that was sent out into space in 1972, because after the moon landings were axed, um, after Apollo 17, um, they, um, you, they, were, you know, they were considered too expensive. They weren't you know, seen as very necessary. We're now entering into the age of the deep space probes, of probes being sent out into the outer reaches of the solar system. And the, the thought was that when they actually reach the end of the solar system, they're gonna go out into wide open space. There may be civilizations out there, there may be aliens. So what are we gonna to say to them? We can't write in English. We have to um, write in symbols. So what they um, have is if the top there is a very, very simple diagram. And um, if you see two circles with like uh, two eyes in it, right at the top left, that is supposed to be a very, very basic symbol for the hydrogen atom. And that's, you know, the, basically what they're saying is that we are, we understand that the basis of all life, of all existence, of all material in the universe is the hydrogen atom. So it's something telling them about you know, what we know, where our intelligence is. There's a little map at the bottom showing the different planets coming from the sun. And it's saying that the pioneer probe, there's a very, very simple um, diagram of it, a little shape. And they're saying which planet it actually comes from. It's the third rock from the sun. But the controversial bit is that um, the, the, the man and the woman at the top. Basically, what this is saying is that, you know, yes, we're humans. This is what we look like. And hello. Now, uh, part of the controversy was obviously they're naked and we tend to wear clothes and they're going to get a bit of a shock when they, they actually meet us. But the, the more, more greater concern was the ethnicity. Uh, when you've got a, um, a planet where there are far more people of colour than there are white people, and you put these two white people up there, a very well-built male and a very curvaceous female. This is very much from a male perspective. You'll notice that it's the man who's stepping forwards and he's the one who's taking the initi initiative to say hi, whereas the female isn't really even making eye contact. She's in a submissive state. And we could go on, you know, we, people could say, you know, about, talk about the ethnicity, they could, might even say things like about the sexuality, the gender, all this type of thing which people are con concerned about nowadays, none of that is reflected. And it's thought that if the aliens do see this and they come to Earth, they're actually going to find a very different humanity to the one that's actually represented here. So here we have the Voyager probe. This was um, a wonderful probe. There were actually two probes, and this was the, these were the ones that went out and looked at the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, um, Neptune, Uranus, um, Uranus, Neptune, and um, sent back these wonderful photographs like we'd never, ever seen before and discovered things like that um, one of the moons around uh, Jupiter, Io, actually has an active volcano on it. Uh, that was found quite by accident um, by somebody who was working a late shift and suddenly noticed something on a screen and said, hang on, what's that? And then stopped and uh, spent some time actually analysing it to find out Io was still uh, a volcanically active satellite. But one of the um, most important photographs that was ever taken was this one here. And you might think to yourself, well, it's a bit of a grainy photograph. What's, um, all, what's going on here? And of course, um, uh, this is something taken by the Voyager probe. You can see the date 1990, because of course these things take years to actually get from one planet to another. Uh, this project was actually, um, put together, uh, there was an intern, a young boy who was working for NASA, and he was looking at the movement of planets, and he worked out there was one time when all the planets would be lined up in such a way in which you could actually slingshot 
this probe around the planets. And so you wouldn't have to use, you know, rocket propellants. You could actually use the gravity to slingshot it around the planets. And um, this was just a young lad and he put it for forwards. And they said, this, we, this is a once in a lifetime um, moment. We've got to do this. But it took years for these probes to actually to get uh, right out to the outer planets of our solar system. And as the uh, probe was leaving our solar system, Carl Sagan, the famous astronomer and writer, um, uh, suggested to NASA that for one last moment, they turn the cameras round and they take a photograph of Earth from the outer edge of the solar system. And this is what they got. And what it shows is Earth in a sunbeam. And I don't know whether you can see this, but um, if I zoom in, Come on, zoom in. Oh, come on. Zoom in. There it is. It's this tiny little speck um, with this, you know, the circle has been put on around it afterwards. But this tiny little speck in this sunbeam that just happened, they just happened to catch it there. But it's another one of those pictures, a bit like the one Earthrise, where you realise that everything that we hold dear, everything that we believe in happened on that tiny little speck in the midst of all that space. And it's very humbling. And I think these, these photographs are very important for us to, to think about just the vastness of the cosmos that we're actually living in and just really how small we are. You know, I remember, I think it was Roosevelt who, um, when he, um, at the end of the, a week, a busy week in politics, he used to take a trip to an observational um, telescope and he used to look out at the planets and at the stars and he did that to put everything in perspective, everything that he was thinking about. There is this bigger world out there, this bigger picture. Uh, I think this is, the, this is all wonderful stuff. Um, other photographs, this is from the Galileo probe and this is the surface of Europa. Now Europa is a frozen moon in the orbit of Jupiter. And it's, I think that's quite a wonderful, a beautiful image. I mean, I could imagine that inspiring artists. I know actually artists who have um, seen a talk I've given on this subject and have gone away and have created things inspired by this. Uh, all those canals, all these strange seams f going so naturally through the ice. And it, it's one, it's a place where there are some people who believe that if we could just land something on Europa and cut through the ice, possibly we could find life. It's the only place in the solar system where possibly there could be um, life underneath the ice, fish, something like that, uh, and, and they'd be warmed up by volcanic vents underneath the ice. And we know, don't we, from Io, that there is volcanic activity on the moons of Jupiter. But I just look at it and I just think of it as a very, very beautiful image. And I could look at this for a long, long time. It's as good as anything you see in nature on this planet. And it's as good as any abstract painting you're ever going to see. Wonderful. This is the Hubble telescope, which was launched in 1990. And some of you may remember that when they first launched it, the, um, it wasn't taking back very good pictures because there was something wrong with the uh, actual lenses. Uh, something was just quite out and they had to send a space shuttle up to fix it. But it's still a wonderful thing. Hubble named after the scientist who persuaded Einstein that the Big Bang was real. And when these pictures came back, they were absolutely amazing. This one is called is known as the Pillars of Creation. And it's so far away that it's thought to be about 7,000 years back in time, i.e. that what you're seeing happened 7,000 years ago. It's taken that long for the light to actually reach us. And it's called the Pillars of Creation because this is an area of space where stars are born from these condensed pillars of matter. Uh, the stars actually ignite and stars actually, you know, perform, which is mind blowing to me. I, my favourite um, comment was from Roy Strong, Sir Roy Strong, who said that this photograph was his famous favourite image of that year when it came out in the early 90s. He thought that it should be used to illustrate uh, William Blake or the Book of Genesis. And yes, that's what I think. I think it is a breathtaking image. Uh, something actually even more beautiful than science fiction artists and you know writers and filmmakers could even have imagined. The what's out there is is beyond imagination. I want to go back to Russia now. This is from 1985. Now look at this. This is the same year that Andy Warhol did that moonwalk 
um, screen print. And here we have something which, to, for my money, is far more interesting and far more exciting. It's by a Russian artist called Ilya Kabakov, and it's called The Man Who Flew Into Space From His Apartment. Now, I've actually seen this, and it's a, what we call an installation. And uh, what it shows is a very, very, very untidy, uh, like a bed set, which has got a camp bed and a wooden bench. And it's uh, the stuff all littered over the floor. There's his shoes, which have been left behind. And on the walls are posters, uh, Soviet posters, posters about what was going on in Russia at the time, um, even sports posters. And uh, here we have this strange contraption, which is made of like rubber belts. Those look like the rubber belts you get in uh, factories, you know, that, um, that, that actually propel old machines, uh, you know, the belts that, that, that uh, were used to propel machines. And these got bed springs. And then in the middle, this strange saddle, which actually looks like it's more like just ripped out of a chair, an old wooden chair. And obviously what that is, is some kind of contraption for sending somebody from their apartment into space. And there's a great big hole in the ceiling where they've gone bang right through the ceiling and into space. And it might seem like um, a bit of a mess. It might seem a bit uh, like he's taking the mick. But for my money, I think this is far closer to the experience of the cosmonauts going into space than that um, uh, Andy Warhol screen print. Because you know, you got to re realize the cosmonauts were just ordinary guys. They were military personnel, but they didn't have huge homes in Beverly Hills. They didn't drive around in Corvettes like the American astronauts. They lived in apartments, just like ordinary guys. And uh, here we have basically, it's it's and you know, I also think there's a comment here about the. Um, the, the technology that the Russians used because the Soviet regime was not known for its great safety. Um, uh, it, there was one um, a spacecraft that they, they had and when the Americans sent their Gemini capsules up in the, the mid sixties, which had two astronauts in, the Russians wanted to show that they could do better. So they put three cosmonauts in a capsule designed for two and it was so, uh, the, the, the weight was so critical. The only way they could actually send them up there is not them not having spacesuits. So if the cosmonauts, there was a leak or something went wrong, the cosmonauts could not get into spacesuits for their own safety. They were very, very vulnerable. And it's a wonder they even came back alive. And I think there's some comment here that there's the Soviet Union posters and they're so desperate to beat the Americans and get, get somebody up there that they don't care. They'll get it up, them up there anyway. And I think this is a marvelous piece of artwork. Um, I really do think it uh, says so much more about the human experience of what it was like to actually be um, part of that space race. Now we're coming towards the end of our, um, uh, of our presentation and um, a lot of people say that think of the space race and they think of science fiction and they think of nerdy young men in anoraks and that it's very much a male orientated uh, endeavor. Um, but what's interesting is three of the greatest artists in the, um, the late 20th century going into the 21st century uh, who have explored the idea of outer space have been women. And this is um, a detail from an installation by my favorite conceptual artist, Susan Hiller who's an American um, um, artist. She started off as an archivist. That was her training in collecting things and cataloging things. And from that, she went on to make uh, artwork of her own. And this one is called Witness from 2000. And I've seen this uh, piece. What you have is a load of radio speakers, each one of those little circles, which is, looks a little bit like it could be a spacecraft or a flying saucer or something, is hanging from a wire. And each one of those is a radio speaker. And what you've got playing out of each radio speaker is um, the testimony of somebody who's actually observed a UFO. And you, you, when, so you see this and you hear this sort of like murmuring as you get close to it. And then when you actually walk up and you can actually walk underneath these and among these, uh, you can actually hear people talking about their experience of seeing a UFO. And then when you look up, you notice that the uh, arrangement of uh, microphones is actually arranged in the form of a cross hanging up in the, uh, in the ceiling. And she said that she wanted this to have the 
the, the effect of being almost like a confessional that these people were talking about things and they knew people wouldn't believe them or people would ridicule them but they uh, said their story anyway and it was a bit like a confessional like confessing your sins to a priest and um, I, I think it's absolutely wonderful Susan Hiller is, is her interest is in those parts of the human psyche and human experience that we don't talk about so a lot of her work is about conspiracy theories and about hauntings and ghost sightings and ufo sightings it's all about that because that's what she finds very interesting the things that get marginalized let's look at another one because actually this is one of my favorite pieces of modern artwork ever in the well, certainly conceptual artwork it's um this is called Cold Dark Matter from, by Dame Cornelia Parker. Now, what this is, is um, uh, Cornelia Parker built a old rickety wooden shed in the middle of a field and she stuffed it with bric-a-brac that she'd found from jumble sales and charity shops. And then she got the British army to come along and blow it up. And there's even, we've got film of her doing it. Um, and uh, then what uh, Cornelia Parker and her studio hands did is they went around the field picking up all the burnt bits of shed and all the bits on the inside and they hang them up on wires with a, a light bulb in the middle so it actually represents that moment of explosion and what it's all talking about of course is the big bang the fact that the universe came from a single moment a moment of creation and I think this is absolutely wonderful. I've been told off for um, going in here and blowing and making some of the bits swing and the, the attendants have said, did you not do that, sir? But I, I just find it so fantastic and well balanced it is and well put together it is. But the fact that there's all this bric-a-brac, all this stuff on the inside, there's musical instruments, there's household things, there's toys, there's you know um, things which could even be seen as um, status symbols. They're all in there. And what she's saying is that everything we worry about, everything we show off about, everything that we're concerned about, it all started off from that one moment of creation. If it wasn't for that, none of this would exist. And all the matter uh, that these things are made of, it all came from this one single point. And I think that's a very poignant uh, you know, point to make. To me, this is like um, a piece of religious art. I would love to see this hanging in a cathedral and God said, "Light, let there be light," and there was light. That's that's the type of feeling it, it gets, uh, it gives me. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Another female artist is Yoyoi Kusama, the Japanese artist who um, spent a long time in America. Really, sort of got got famous in America, uh, but now uh, works back in her native um, land of Japan, where she's a bit of a superstar there. And this was um, uh, another installation that she put together that I had the, uh, the wonderful privilege of being able to go in and have a look at it back in 2012. Um, this is actually on show at the moment as I speak in the Tate, um, uh, the Tate Modern, but uh, you have to have tickets and I went in, towards the end of December and I was told you can't get tickets for this until the beginning of April. It's a very, very popular installation. I'm glad I managed to see it when, uh, when I could. But what it is, is a room and on all of the walls there are mirrors. And then hanging in the room are these lights and these lights change colour. They're a bit like you know those fancy Christmas lights, but they're all little globes, little spheres. And when you walk into it, you just feel as if you are in outer space. You, you feel as if, you know, the, 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 it would just go on forever and ever and ever. And it is actually one of the most beautiful, one of the most remarkable uh, experiences I've, I've ever known. Um, and I would, if, if you are prepared to wait to get tickets, you do get an opportunity to see this, then I would recommend that you um, go, and do, go, go and do so because it is absolutely marvellous. Uh, experience but you know again notice it's these three female artists who are who are doing this and you know I have to say I, I often find that the, the most leading edge artists today are, 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 the, are the girls if you'll excuse my, my expression there's the, the female artists are much better um, and they're, they're, they're kind of looking into areas that a lot of people think are taboo you don't you don't do art about that but they're doing it and I think that's a, a remarkable thing a remarkable um, change that's happened in the last 50 years or so and I want to end now with a um, piece by 
um, an artist called Yinka Shonibert, who is a Nigerian born British artist. And this was from 2016. And this is called Refugee Astronaut. Now, um, Yinka Shonibert's um, sort of trademark is that he uses these fabrics which we associate with African wraps, the things, you know, that, that um, African women uh, dress in. And he, he buys these in bulk from um, a market in Brixton, I believe. But the interesting thing about these fabrics is we associate them with Africa, but they were actually made in Indonesia by Dutch. And they were, they were started, you know, the, the, the process of manufacturing was by Dutch colonists actually took. So even something which we associate with, with Africa is really all about colonization. And I think there's a very political and interesting and important um, uh, statement that he's making there. But here he's done lots and lots of things with this, this fabric, but I'm interested in these astronauts that he's made. And uh, so here you have the astronaut with his African print and he's walking along. Is this a moonwalk? Is this a spacewalk? I don't know. And he's got these um, all this rubbish on his back. And in some ways, this stuff that he's got on his back is a bit like the stuff that Cornelia Parker um, packed his um, her um, shed with before she blew it up. And so, you know, the, the idea of refugees in this day and age, of course, is very poignant because of the refugee crisis. We have the people escaping wars, particularly in, in the Middle East, but they're in you know, South America, they're all over the world, India. Um, and here you have, this is like, almost like humankind is like a refugee. We've got our dark background, our colonial background. And even though if we talk against what, uh, you know, the exploitation of um, uh, less developed parts of the world, uh, we still use mobile phones. We still use cars, which have parts which are actually mined in those places. We're all guilty of the exploitation of the third world. And here we have this astronaut and he's a refugee, not just from any particular country, but he's a refugee from the earth. He doesn't know his place in the universe. He doesn't know, uh, he has no place, he has no home. He's walking around like a complete outsider. And I think that's a very interesting way of looking at um, humankind uh, at this part of the early 21st century. So that's my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it. And I want to say thank you very much for um, joining me and uh, watching this. And I hope in some ways this might inspire you to dig up other artworks, look, at, look up some of the names I've mentioned and actually find for yourself your own artworks inspired by the space race. Thank you.